<laughs> morning. My Lord, what a morning. My high Lord, what a morning. My high Lord, what a morning. When the stars begin to fall, you will hear the sinners wailing. You will hear the sinners wailing. You will hear the sinners wailing when the stars begin to fall. I used to love being in choir when I was growing up in high school and junior high. Sadly, when I was growing up in junior high and high school, I sang for soprano. <laughs> it doesn't sound like that in my ear anymore. Boy, you know, even when I listen to Vivo and the recordings of my own voice, yeah, it's not the way I sound. I know better now. But it's true. That's the way I sound, but it's just not the way I remember sounding. So I'm always interested in, well, okay, I'm not that interested in the way I sound. I have to just, by faith, go for it, because otherwise I would never open my voice again compared to what I hear. Now, sometimes when I have a cold, I kind of like that voice, but we won't go there. But I remember, you know, being able to sing and being in front of the choir and having all these lead parts, you know, the guy that was like, like Vercelli, you know, out there singing his heart out, you know, just reaching those notes and touching them and knowing the vibrato and knowing how to breathe and how to project and how to give that kind of results with my voice. And I loved being in front of the crowd at that time because I was such a shy kid that that release for me was done through music. Later in life, I was still a wallflower and kind of ugly, you know, and haven't changed much over the years. <laughs> but uh, my confidence level has gone up some. <laughs> Why? I'm not sure, but it has. Maybe it's just your belligerence of ugliness, but being a wallflower, it gives you that ability inside to recognize who you are, <laughs> which really isn't much to look at. But uh, you kind of like recognize that, you know, in you, there's no, else, no good thing because you can see it in the mirror every day. <laughs> so if you ugly, you know it. <laughs> but. In my life, I grew up with that internal insecurity of a person who has a self-image issue. And to compensate, you know, I learned logic. I learned a lot of things and a lot of techniques for survival about communication and talking and running for your life. <laughs> and I ran a lot. <laughs> ah! You know, and most people, while they learned, you know, the art of commando, you know, or got a gun or got a knife, you know, me, I was running for my life and talking fast. But God caused me over the years, and even in my latter years, you know, after I became a Christian, to trust in Him and not have to worry about those things. And to have an esteem that was built upon His opinion of me and not my own. That's why I don't go along with the popular notion somehow that you love others as you love yourself and that you have to love yourself first. No, you don't love yourself first. I'm sorry, you can't go there with that scripture. That's not the way it works. You love God because he can give you a proper perspective of you. You ugly. <laughs> he loves you anyways. <laughs> so, I was thinking as I was getting ready to read this devotion that, um, not for all about it, it made me laugh so much, you know, the joy of having a relationship with God just what he's done in my life that I've already forgotten what it was I was thinking of this morning. Imagine that. But I was thinking that I'm one of those kinds of people that when you wanted the job done, if you wanted the job done, you'd call me and I'd get the job done. I used to be in ministry that way that if the pastor and Calvary uh, Anchorage learned that a long time ago, Calvary Chapel Anchorage with um, Dwight Green, that if Dwight said something from the pulpit, the next day we got it done. And it was just the way that God made me and allowed me to understand 
what he wanted in my life to be able to complete the things that people would say out of their mouth, whether it was right or wrong, I would just go ahead and do it and accomplish it because I'd pray about it and go for it. And I remember one time Dwight was talking about the sound system that I ran, you know, and I worked on the sound system. I did the board, you know, and uh, I remember he was talking to me and my roommate because we were both basically, I brought him in on the sound, you know, and he would do cables and he would do mics, you know. Usually you always should have two people on sound. But anyways, I was doing the soundboard for Calvary at the time. And as part of the worship community, you know, I, I got involved in it later because his wife was the only one that was doing worship. But um, I remember he, Dwight said something about he was tired of seeing all these cables, you know, that were strung around in this. We were in the upper second story and you could see us from the freeway you know, but we were in the second story of this building and uh he mentioned one day that you know he was tired of seeing our snake basically you know because you have a snake that goes from your mixer board out to your stage and you plug into your stage well we didn't have a snake <laughs> it wasn't that far away so we really didn't need to run a snake you know we were running direct cabling you know so we had all the cables, you know, kind of like, you know, coming from the stage straight to the board, which is, you know, technically what you do kind of, you know, when you're, you know, a roadie with a band, you know, and you can put your, your sound board or your mixer board right up front if you want to, which is really kind of like blow your ears out. But, you know, you can do that. But we had, um, Dwight had mentioned that, you know, and, and, uh, Dwight was a lovable guy, you know what I mean? I think he got out of ministry eventually. <laughs> I think he went back into business, but at the time, you know, he was a lovable guy. And so, you know, we, he had said that one Sunday. So I told my roommate, I said, okay, well, let's, let's run the cables. You know, let's go ahead and pull cable and uh, we'll do it just like we do at a network. You know, I said, we'll get some, why don't we just, you know, pull it through the walls, you know, because we had the suspension walls, you know, they call them different, whatever they call them, but, you know, acoustic ceilings, you know, and so you run it through the ceiling that's suspended. And I said, you know, we can run it to the back, run it up and run it out. You know, and my roommate said, well, why don't we get some PVC and run it through that? I went, ooh, because I knew about how sound creates noise. That what we call sound is really noise. It's just this decibel levels of noise that's being oscillated outward and your ears hear it. And it interprets it into a way of understanding that you make it sound as though it were words, rhythms. Um, it's oscillations, and if the oscillations are even, then we call that rhythm. And it's just something that you can see on a scope, you know, that you understand that that's noise. <laughs> and that electricity makes noise, your body makes noise, everything around you is that's electrical is making noise. You might not be able to hear all the noise, but the 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 spectrum of your listening attentive behavior of your ears that's able to interpret it. It hears it, but it doesn't necessarily make the connection in your brain for you to understand it. Dogs have ex excellent capabilities of hearing. Um, other animals and other things have that capability of hearing noise to a certain decibel levels. And so they're able to understand it and to adapt it and to apply it so that they can react to it. We basically don't listen very well. And so, it's funny because I remember just recently talking to a pastor about noise and he thought I was nuts. And I thought, I don't know. Well, <laughs> okay. You know, well, you, you get there. You know, it's like, well, what do you think noise level is? <laughs> um, music level? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, well, I didn't bother. You know, I knew that I needed to keep my mouth shut and just suffer the slings and arrows of the, you know, assault that I felt. And uh, but Dwight had mentioned that he wanted it done. So we took... It took us all of seven days, but we spent day and night, literally, going after, you know, my roommate worked. So after his job was done, mine was early morning routes. I would work for the Anchorage Daily News at the time. And um, at night, we would go to the church and we were running PVC and pulling and trying to get all these cables through this really small. We only had a certain size PVC, but we had extra, so we were using that. No matter what, we were going to do it. So we were pulling cable through this PVC. And it was a struggle. It was a challenge. But by the time Sunday hit, Dwight stood up there, and he was just dumbfounded. He just stood there grinning. Dwight was kind of, you had to picture Dwight. Dwight was kind of a, 
not a roly-poly black man, but he was kind of like a, just a, a peaceful, nice guy. Dwight was a nice guy. He's what you would always call the nice guy. He just looked good, and when he grinned, he just, he'd have that little, just grin, you know. Just, now these guys, they blessed me. You know, I mean, he just, nice guy, you know. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, the ministry didn't pay so good, so he needed to get out of being a nice guy as a pastor and got back into, I think, probably into, I think he went to Kinko's or whatever. But the point is, is that, we accomplished the purpose. We would get the job done. So in my early Christian walk, it was always, that was what I was doing, was the same thing I did at work. Get the job done. Well, different jobs along the way, I learned that I couldn't just be the Superman to be always the one that got the job done. I had learned early in my life as a manager at a McDonald's that I had, I had brought along what we called a super crew. And I would take my crew into, you know, wherever we were at, and we could, boom knock down records. I mean, it just was like, wow, they were trained and we were like the hotshot crew. And so I rewarded them, you know, and they would, you know, I was teaching them how to be managers and that because at one time in those days, back in the 70s, I think, or maybe 80s or 90s, somewhere around in there, um, McDonald's was noted for its management training class, that it was one of the leaders in management training that at that time, it wasn't, you know, it was listed in Forbes and all these fancy magazines of, you know, business that, you know, those people that had gone through management training at McDonald's were highly skilled and were being desired and were actually being yanked out of fast food in order to go into other industries and other means because they had learned such interpersonal communication skills. And so I was fascinated by that, but, you know, I did that. And so I had learned how to not just be a wonderkin which a wonderkin is somebody who could get the job done. That's boom, they, they're able to do it like Ted Turner. You know, he pulled it, he pulled off a miracle. You know, I mean, one man pulled off a new service, you know, and it's like, wow. But or like a Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, a wonderkin, or like, you know, the iPad inventor. Um, I know I'm going to forget his name now, but he's a wonderkin. You know, people that are inspired to do something, but they are so focused in on what they're doing that, they can do it by themselves, but they can't do it with others. And so I learned how to be a manager, you know, and a supervisor and to bring out skills in others. But it wasn't my forte. You know, I really liked when I was by myself getting the job done because I could get it done faster, quicker and get it over with way before a team could get it done. And no matter what I did with this hotshot team, they just couldn't do it the way I could. And I was always faster and better and quicker. And, you know, I kind of depended on that. And I don't know why I was, you know, it wasn't sugar rush and it wasn't these days now with power drinking or power aid or some kind of, you know, whatever indulgences that people do in order to be faster or be quicker or be more abrupt. But I just enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. You know, maybe it was words of wisdom, words of knowledge. But I had learned the two, you know, and so eventually in my life I had learned, you know, the idea of being independent and the idea of working with codependents or working with people that, work together cooperatively to accomplish a goal. When I got in ministry, I found that that was pretty messed up. <laughs> I, found out, I found out that ministry is really messed up. Matter of fact, you know, uh, you know, there may be some dogmatic, you know, some real corporate organized ministries out there, but they're messed up because <laughs> it has nothing to do with what you think. As a matter of fact, ministry has absolutely nothing to do with your abilities. It has nothing to do with your strengths. It has probably a lot to do with your weaknesses, but it has everything to do with God. Bottom line. You see, ministry is all about ministering. And that means to the person, not to the goal. Often in life, we see things that we think is the goal or the prize or the direction or the object that we're going after. And God looks at it and says, no, no, no. And you go, what? What do you mean, no? No. What do you mean, stop? What? You know, you're heading in a direction. You know, you're like, maybe you're driving the car 60 miles an hour, and then suddenly God says, stop. And you're on a freeway, and you're going, I don't think so. Well, God can do that. I know. I've been there. Oh, you pull over and stop. You know, and then guess what? You know, down the road, you say, hey, wow, look at that, man. There's a tornado. It just wiped out the freeway. Well, you can either obey or disobey. 
it's your choice. I mean, you have the freedom and the rights and the privileges, according to American Christianity, to do what you want to do. Go for it. Let me know how that works out for you. But you see, that's the difference between having a personal living God that you can interlocute with, or we would say to have intercourse with. Now, I know you have a dirty mind, and you probably think intercourse is about sex only. Well, that's not what intercourse is. It means crossing paths. That's what it means, to intersect, to intercourse. You know, you intercourse the two different directions, you know. Sorry, it's not just boom, 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 or whatever you do, boom, 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 or however people do it nowadays, to indicate, you know, um, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, to indicate interlocutions of two physical bodies when they come to conjunction of the realities of the procreation situation with which they find themselves in. You know, it's going to be interpreted in some scientific terms. But anyway, the point being is that, you know, it's not all about sex. You know, that's not that word. That word doesn't mean that. I'm sorry, you know, if you think it does. There's other reasons for that meaning. But you could put it that way if you want to. You could have sex with God. If you want to call becoming one with the living God sex, I mean, you know, that's okay, you know, if it works for you, well, fine. But really, God wants us to be one with him. He wants us to learn how to go with the flow, like we used to say in the Jesus movement, because if you were kind of like going in a direction and God said, flow left, you'd flow left. It wouldn't even be a problem because you're flowing, not fighting. And that's the difference between what I see in Christians today is that a lot of times Christians are bucking the system. They're fighting against something rather than going with the flow of the spirit. If the spirit sees something, it's like water. You know, if you see a rock, you flow over it. If you see a rock, you flow around it. If you see a rock, you flow under it. No matter what it is, that rock standing there, you don't stand up the water, you know, and say, oh, I'm going to take a stand. I'm a stand of water, and I'm going to stand here in a river, you know, and make all the water just stand still and fight this rock. Um, no. <laughs> I don't know about you, but, you know, I've been to the ocean, you know. I've seen the tides, you know. I see the tide come in, I see the tide go out. I watch Christians, I see the tides come in, and I see the tides go out. And, you know, sometimes they come in, you know, and, you know, the Christians are standing there on the sand, you know, and they know what they're doing. Sometimes they're standing on the sand and they're having a clue what they're doing, and the riptide comes along and washes them out to sea because they got caught up into the world and they're dragged out into the... The sea is like a, indicative of the world and its ways, the ocean, like, you know, the peoples of all peoples. And so I'm amazed that, you know, Christians get so caught up in these issues and these things that they fight against when they're supposed to be like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got love like an ocean. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Whoa, whoa. That's what you should be. But I see Christians getting more like the rock. You know, they'll be like, there's this rock right there, you know, in the middle of the river. And they somehow want to stop the river to fight the rock. I don't know how many rivers you've been in. Um, I've been in some pretty crazy rivers, you know, and some pretty, pretty trickling, babbling brooks, you know, and I've been in some raging, roaring, kind of like, over in Oregon, kind of like, you know, massive, over, under, through, and around, and overdue, you know, those kind of rivers, and even the waterfalls, you know, like at Yosemite, you know, or, you know, just any river you want to pick, the river keeps going. Do you get it? The river keeps flowing. The river is going and flowing because it's knowing its destination. It doesn't stop for the rock. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know that you just went through an issue with Duck Dynasty, but, you know, there really was no issue. You just need to be like a river and keep going. You know, ignore it. Go on. It's going to not do any difference whether you watch television or not watch television. If you're not watching television, you never would have noticed. <laughs> uh, boy, people get so wrapped up about these things. You know, It's kind of like elections. You know, People get all wrapped up in elections. And I go, you know, personally, it doesn't make much difference who gets elected. It's still the same. One way or another, you pay. You pay for who you elect. You know, I mean, that's the way it goes. You pay for it, you know, one way or another. You do. It doesn't matter who's there. You're going to pay for it. So the fact is, you be like a river. You be like the river that flows because you know your destination. Rivers flow to the ocean, most of them. 90% go into, you know, the ocean or a lake. 
Most of the reservoirs you're seeing are man-made. That's why they call it a reservoir. You know, that lake, giant lake that's behind a dam. It uh, wasn't always there, but usually most things run from uphill, downhill, outward, you know. And the springs are all meant to run out of their fountain from where they come from in the center of the earth or in the earth itself in the crust. That God causes to spring forth and to go out. I know that at Spring Creek, a river that I was managing a resort that I was working at at one time in Oregon, the mouth of the river wasn't a mouth. It was like these little kind of bubbles that were coming out of the sand. You know, I mean, you'd go all the way up Spring Creek to the very end of it, and you could see where it's bubbling up. Bubbling, 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 bubbling over, bubbling over. Jesus love is the bubbling over. Jesus love is in my soul. Jesus love is the bubbling over. One, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah. Camp Floria, sorry. <laughs> my mother used to be into this kind of like Christian music that was like joy filled. <laughs> oh, what a novel idea. Wake up in the morning and be joy filled. Oops, that's what we're doing right now. So, the river itself is what you're meant to be like. You're supposed to bubble up and bubble out with what God has put inside to come out. Yeah, really, what goes inside is supposed to bubble outside and be like a river going out to people around you. You're not supposed to go out and try to drown anybody. <laughs> Sorry, that's not what he meant. You're not supposed to go out and take, you know, the joy or the love of God that's the flowing out of your life, you know, the love, the joy, and the peace, the peace that comes out of you, the love that comes out of you, the joy that flows out of you, is a river. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets those captives free. i got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well. Gush, gush. Be a gusher. Don't be a pusher. <laughs> Because that's what a lot of people are doing now. They're pushing an agenda on you. They're pushing you into fitting into a box of morals and moralities that aren't part of your Christianity. Jesus was in a big, giant effect, contrary to everything that people wanted to do. They wanted to make him king. Uh-uh, -oh, man, I'm out of here. And he walked the other way. They wanted to throw him off a cliff, and he walked back through the crowd. They wanted to make him a king, and he said, no, I'm a servant. What? Reality check. You be a river of joy, be a river of peace, be a river of love. Because you're not meant to run into the rocks. You're going to splash over it. So every time you run into your trials, tribulations, and everything else, just go over it. Or go around it. Or go under it. But you're going to be a river, so you're going to flow and go. Until you, rest your until, you res until you rest your destination. Until you arrive at your destination. Which is the ocean. You're going to minister to all those salty, crusty people out there, you know, that are in the ocean that are like, you know, barnacles on the bottom of a boat. You know what I mean? They're pretty crusty, some of them, you know. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what you want to minister to. So don't get yourself caught up in the sidetracks and the three-ring circus that Christianity has become. Don't get involved in all the little issues that, you know, somehow your little church body wants to sign the petition, you know, we got to fight that law. We got to fight that people. You know, we got to argue about this. We got to argue about that. I got news for you. I, I think Jesus told me to just love on them, you know, and that they would change. You know, if I just loved them, they would change. Love covers a multitude of sins. And quite frankly, you know, kind of what happened to me. I got saved because people loved on me. You know, it had nothing to do with um, being told I was a sinner. Had nothing to do with being told that I was, you know, like messed up or screwed up or in some way, you know, needed to fess up or, you know, get fed up. Uh, no, you know, I mean, we kind of were looking in the Jesus moment for peace, love, and joy. And somehow now we're not telling people about peace. We're not giving people love. And we're sure as hell not telling people about how to be joyful. We're telling them what they got to do in order to get through. Or we got what they got to do in order to be true. Either way, being true or getting through, it's all about you. You see the point? It's wrong. It's the wrong direction because it's got the wrong reflection. You can tell what direction you're going by the reflection you're becoming. Am I a reflection of what Jesus said and did and lived? Or am I a direction of going into what the church is telling me to do and become and grow into? 
yeah, man, I got to cut my hair short now, you know, I got to put away my tats, you know, I got to kind of like quit being at that, you know, and be quit being at this, you know, and I got to work it out, you know, and kind of get my basics down, you know, and be what, you know, maybe, maybe you aren't. Maybe you can't be that. Maybe you're a mess, and God likes the mess that you are, because you messed up, and guess what? Everybody else messed up too, and one mess can help another mess get less messed. You get it? Flow. Go with the flow. Be who you know yourself. Be you. Be real. Be the reality of what God wants you to be. And then you'll find in your everyday life satisfaction. I have got some satisfaction. I have got some satisfaction. Who could ask for anything more? <laughs> Think upon me, my God, for good. Thus saith the Lord, I remember you. The kindness of thy youth, the love of your espousals, how you loved me so much with the first love, and when you went after me in the wilderness, how you pursued me, and you listened to my voice, and you walked in my will, and you did my ways. I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish unto you an everlasting love, a joy and a peace, a covenant of grace that I will give unto you. I will visit you and perform my good word towards you. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord God Almighty, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end, not one to start all over again. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Your ways can take the highways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, because I purchased you, you're bought. I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause which do with great things and unsearchable and marvelous things without number. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered than the stars in the universe. And that's the way that your life should be accomplishing in your strife. Because sure, you may go through some of the trials of your stupidities, you know, some of the aggravations of the nations, some of the frustrations of the enemy trying to, you know, render you worthless, meaningless, and hopeless, and, you know, kind of like heartless, and, you know, like less merciful, and less giving, and less loving, and less forgiving, you know, kind of like most people you meet. <laughs> but given a chance, given an opportunity, given a hearty, hi-ho, silver, and away we go, you could be the hero of the day. You could be the hero of the way. You could be one of the greatest heroes of the Bible for a moment in time. Because you could take the time to listen to what God has to say. Because God is looking for they whose heart is perfect towards him. That in meekness and in weakness, they turn towards God. And they don't look to the fist but they look to the one who has the ability to make all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to its purpose. You can take your righteous anger and your righteous wrath and you can clash your fists and clash your hands and make it all into something where you can stand, but guess what? The stand you're taking is on you. Slipping sand. And the tide is going out. And you're being pulled in the wrong direction. You need to come to shore. You need to stand with Jesus, not stand on some principle or some issue, some dogma, some doctrine, some church, or some idea that you got. You need to know who has been bought. You. And who bought you. He did. And what he bought you for. Save people from their sins. So, if you really got anything inside that's left, you know, not right, but has been placed inside by the word of God, by the love of God, by the spirit of God, for the people of God, to give the joy of the Lord, to give the word of the Lord, to give Jesus, the son of God, to the people who need him, then I would say to you, be like a river. Be like a fountain. Be like that one who flows over the things that are coming at you, that flows around the things that are coming to stumble you, that goes under the things that are trying to involve you in. So that you won't be standing still in a river that's running to the ocean. But rather, you'll be just like one other part of that river that's rolling and flowing and going 
all the way from the wellsprings of salvation to the heavenly home with which the God of Almighty has created the waters of the earth in order to bless the people with living waters. Would you not like to be that kind of effect on the reality of everyone who's alive and living today in this last generation? That you will be called living waters? That you will be called the fountain of God? That you have something to bless the people with? Or are you just another test for someone else to put up with you? And that you're just a trial and a tribulation rather than an explanation of the love of God and the joy with which you can see a Christian by what he's going through and how he knows to manifest, manifest, to make manifest, to make manifestation of the grace and the salvation that they've been given so that they can give an exaltation in the midst of a trial and tribulation and say, praise ye the Lord, his mercy endures forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's get a little Pentecostal now, shall we? Because that's really what I think you need to be.